Before telling you about cerebral science, let's talk about Mark. He gets into a car accident and is immediately taken to the hospital for an emergency repair of his skull fracture. During his open brain surgery, his neurosurgeon and anesthesiologist take advantage of the fact that his brain pulsates. This movement is known as cerebral pulsatility and is closely monitored as a way to determine how his brain is performing during the surgery. Currently, the measurement technique is limited to a qualitative determination where the surgeon places his finger on the brain and makes an assessment. However, this can easily result in inaccurate determinations, leading to complications during and after the surgery. Recognizing the need for improvement, our team at Stevens Institute of Technology designed a solution to this problem. My name is Maria. And my name is David, and this is CerebroSense. So as you um, may know, pulsatility is a metric used in neurosurgery to measure the status of the patient during the surgery. It is defined as the change in cerebral volume over the change in cuff pressure. Now, as you can imagine, there are a number of complications that take place during brain surgery. Uh, some of the top three are uh, cerebral ischemia, stroke, and edema. So the way it works right now, as Maria mentioned, is that the neurosurgeon will physically put his fingers on the brain to feel how tight it is or how well it's pulsating. And as engineers, we know we need a better metric than that, so we've developed something quantitative, which is CerebroSense. And it is the first device of its kind to offer a real-time, non-contact, and quantitative measuring tool. So every year, there are over 160,000 craniotomies, and 20% of these result in some type of complication. And each complication costs approximately $60,000 per year to treat. So if we could reduce those complications by uh, a little more than 5%, we could save the U.S. markets $480 million per year. So now that you know a little bit about the problem, let's talk about the solution. So we'll start off with some of the design components. Uh, first and foremost is the ultrasonic sensor. This works very similar, similarly to that of sonar on a ship or a submarine where it sends a sound signal to the bottom of the ocean, bounces up, and measures the distance that way. We've also integrated a camera to act as uh, the scope per se, so the neurosurgeon knows exactly what he's looking at because the uh, sensor doesn't inherently have uh, viewing capabilities. We've also created an adjustable medical stand and a sensor camera housing unit. Uh, finally, we've developed a human machine interface using LabVIEW. Uh, so that is the interface for the neurosurgeon and anesthesiologist to gather readings and input the necessary parameters. So to tell you about the methods behind um, the way that we're actually doing this determination, we have a couple of steps, um, steps over here. So the first one being acquiring the data from the sensor. So the sensor is allowing us to determine a voltage, and then we move into the second step, which is actually the conversion of the voltage to a distance. So you can picture a sphere. We have an, an initial radius, and then we have a radial change, right? A, a sphere actually pulsating. So then we're interested in that radial change to, the, to then convert it into a changing volume. As Dave mentioned, pulsatility is actually changing volume over the changing cuff pressure. Cuff pressure, we take it from the patient during the sur surgery. So then as soon as we get to change in volume, then we can um, finally get to a fourth step, which is actually outputting pulsatility. Um, also to show you a little bit about the development of our prototypes, this was the first idea that we had, which was a hamster ball, and it was the easiest way to reflect the behavior of the brain in an enclosed environment. So we have a hamster ball, as you see it over there, with the opening reflecting a craniotomy, which is the opening of the skull, and then we have the balloon inside also connected to a syringe, which is actually doing the pulsation uh, when, when we're injecting air into that um, initial prototype. And then we developed into the current model, which is the skull model. Um, it, it reflects the um, anatomical space a little bit better. And then we also have the cap over there. We're just showing an exaggerated picture. But then we also have the balloon simulating the brain. And in addition to that, the ultrasonic sensor together with the camera um, to have the visual feedback um, attached to a data acquisition system and the power supply and the rest of the circuit components. All right, so we have an image of a brain on the next page. So if anyone's squirmish, just Disclaimer. Um, so here is the actual uh, HMI, the user interface. On the left side, you'll see the actual uh, front panel um, on the left, and on the right, uh, the actual view of the brain, so the camera is zoomed in. Uh, we have a video after this, so I'll just go through this quickly. These three are the parameters on the left. Uh, the first two are the height and the width of the size of the craniotomy, and the third is, is the change in cuff pressure, which in this case we've set to be a constant uh, 25 millimeters of mercury change. And then the graphs on top is the um, 
distance from the sensor, which is then converted to a change in radius for, with this gauge here. And then that's from there, we put the value into our algorithm and calculates the change in volume, which is shown in this increasing bar graph here. And then below, we divide the um, change in uh, volume to, uh, by the uh, constant cuff pressure. And next, we'll show you a short clip of this, act this happening in action. So as you can see, the sensor is running. We haven't yet started inflating the balloon within the brain. So the line is constant. And then on the bottom, picture in picture, you can see us starting to inflate. And now the readings have um, started to come in. So the inflation is happening. You can see the distance is increasing and decreasing from the sensor, which then ultimately allows um, the radius to increase and decrease as seen, uh, correlating to the volume. And then finally, we divide to, to uh, gain the pulsatility, which is overall the metric the neurosurgeons will use to de decide what compensations to, to uh, tell the anesthesiologist to use. All right, so behind um, this whole prototype creation, we also have um, a couple of um, experimental verifications. So the first test that we performed was a change in volume test, which was a fundamental test to actually prove that the sensor is able to create a pulsatility value, um, an accurate pulsatility value. So to do that, we actually did something similar to what you saw in the video, which is um, injecting a known volume of air and comparing it to whatever the sensor was giving us experimentally. That's why you see over here in this graph the overlap of both the theoretical and the experimental, and they showed a difference of less than 10%, which was our passing criteria for this particular test. And the other test that we performed is a temperature test, which we did in order to show that the, the sensor is actually harmless um, when we're exposing the surface of the brain. Um, so in this case, we were able to measure the temperature difference um, after leaving the sensor applied to the surface of the balloon for a certain period of time. And we also saw um, successful results in this, in this experiment because we saw a variation of less than one degree in this case. Cerebrosensis also um, has the ability to really enter the market by targeting surgeons and anesthesiologists who have, who have ties to medical schools. We believe this is a good way to do it um, since it's a, it's a perfect way to actually get into the curriculum and make its use as standard practice early on onto their careers. Um, to, um, to show you some of the statistics in here, in 2016 we have um, complications in open brain surgeries that actually added up to $2 billion only in the US. So by offering Cerebrosense at an estimated price of 20,000, we're gonna be able to save the whole healthcare system. And at the same time, we are able to generate a market potential of $100 million. So with any medical device or biotech device, there is always future work needed to optimize it and ultimately try and perfect it. So the first step would be to gain 510K class two approval. And we hope to start animal trials uh, in the next year, uh, middle of 2018, thank you. Uh, in addition, we hope to improve, or we will improve uh, the cerebral volume technique, our algorithm, as well as the housing and stand, so we can have a seamless transition from the operating room and then back out as the neurosurgeon seems uh, as fit. Then we need to automate the determination of craniotomy size. So right now, the surgeon will actually use a ruler to measure the craniotomy size. That's done all the time. And we're hoping to use the camera that we implemented to um, compute and actually use computer vision to measure that, the size automatically. And finally, probably most important, is to establish a pulsatility standard. Right now, if you were to go on your phone and Google pulsatility, you probably would not find very much. So it's, we're going to be tasked with actually determining and creating a standard so that the um, neurosurgeon and the anesthesiologist can look at it and say, OK, the pulsation is here. This is what it was. This is how we should compensate. And this is how we should proceed. Uh, just so far, we've already been working on this project for more than a year now, and uh, we've had some pretty um, great accomplishments. As a team, we um, went to Johnson Johnson Engineering Showcase, the um, Northeast Bioengineering Conference, uh, International Society of Pharmaceutical Engineers, and our own Innovation Expo. And we had great, great results in each of those events. And then also in the early part of November, we'll be heading to Washington, DC to compete in the Collegiate Inventors Competition for the National Inventors Hall of Fame. So keep your eyes open for that in CerebroSense. Uh, this time, we'd just like to thank our professors, Dr. Vicki Hazelwood and Dr. Marissa Gray, uh, for both from Stevens. They've been invaluable resources, and they're here today. So thank you so much for your help. And also, Dr. Glenn Atlas is an anesthesiologist from Rutgers University Medical School, and he's been also a great resource. With that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time, 
and I just wanted to let you know that we look forward to your help and our efforts to reducing complications, minimizing costs, and ultimately, ultimately saving lives. Thank you, and we look forward to your questions. Question. So have you guys optimized for the working distance of the sensor, and have you guys also optimized for the length of the wavelength? Yes, the, the, the wavelength uh, has been tested. It is, remains constant. So um, yes, to answer your question, it has been optimized. We've run tests at different distances to make sure that that didn't alter the variability, because the sensor, you know, it's not going to be in place the entire surgery. It's going to be put on for 30 to 60 seconds, gather a reading, and taken away. So we've tested it. The sensor works from between one centimeter and 30 centimeters away. So the optimal range of around 10 to 15 centimeters. Question over there. Correct. Um, so why did you choose to go to such an extreme measure of actual pulsatility versus just being able to see the difference in motion? Right? That's the first question. Mm -hmm. Correct. I can take the first yeah, part yeah. at least. Um, all right. So the first for the first part, um, I will say why not, right? Um, I think a big part uh, of this project has been working close with our anesthesiologist. He came to us with this problem and he said, "I need a better way to do this, right? And if you can do it quantitatively, that will be ideal." So that was kind of like our 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 high goal over there. Um, we consider other options um, in the development of this project, but I think having that quantitative uh, measurements out there was definitely our priority um, and at, at the same time our non-contact so we first didn't want to touch a brain and second wanted to output a quantitative value and I think that relates to your second question in the sense that we're kind of like the first um, you know a group working on this particular measurement there are some other um, research that has been done in cerebral compliance but pulsatility is, is a new concept and as you said is it, it was a performed before just qualitatively so if we really want to be out there saying we're creating this device, we want to provide you not only with a device, but also with a book of like, oh, this is a table, this is a pulsatility value, this is how much you, ca you have to compensate for it. That's the reason why we really wanted to offer a number over there. Um, that's the reason why we wanted to create a quantitative determination. And then... Um, second, question. second question. So your second question was referring to the sensitivity, the sensitivity of between the sensor versus... You're asking why we jumped from a finger to something that's accurate to point, you know, zero, zero millimeters. Well, the surgeon can, be, can, can feel something. Yes. Right? Mm -hmm. We believe. Uh, so if, that's, if that is the minimum mark between not feeling something and feeling something, that is at least the minimum requirement for your device. Correct. So what is that? So I would say the minimum requirement is to detect the change during the course of the surgery. So if, if Early on, we hope that the, the device kind of serves as a GPS nowadays. Even if you know where you're going, you're going to turn it on just to make sure you're going along the, along the, the correct route. So the neurosurgeon will continue to use uh, his fingers for the, for the you know, early portions of verifi verifi verifying uh, this device. Um, but overall, he's going to realize, he or she's going to realize that the sensor is giving him a value, giving her, her, him or her a value that is of greater value than just his fingers. And I guess a big part to complement that question is also to say that our device, um, just for experienced surgeons, they have been doing this for, for years in a qualitative manner. So that's why we really want to be able to offer an extra device in addition to what they are doing already, um, just in case they don't want to just transition to say, oh, I'm not going to touch your brain anymore. I'm just going to do the device. The idea is to use both and eventually transition into only um, the, qualitative, the quantitative determination. Yes. Um, you mentioned a lot about being able to measure it and being able to give that information, but you didn't really talk anything about what decisions are then made and how that might improve the quality of care. Correct. Are people dying as a result of this? Yes. 
So. Right, so yes, we didn't mention the exact uh, compensation methods. The three main ones are increasing mannitol uh, injection to decrease the surface tension in the brain. The second is hyperventilating to give them extra oxygen so the um, brain doesn't have to stress and pulsate as much. And the third is to actually cut more of the skull off to increase uh, the ability to pulsate. Um, so yeah, does that, does that answer your question? Or? Yeah. Right. That's, that goes back to the part of developing the standard. So there, there's, you know, there's a lot more research that, that needs to be done to develop what the exact or what the optimal pulsatility is for a patient. From there, we will develop the standard, say, if the pulsatility has decreased 15% in this amount of time, you should administer this much mannitol. So that's, we have not gotten to that point yet, but that is the next step in the, in the project. Thank you for your question. It's a good question. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ryan Prince, and we are presenting on behalf of Purdue Mind. With me is our president, Jason Ummel, and our director of entrepreneurship, Scott Guidaboni. And we are proud to present the Exo Mind Glove. In the United States alone, there is a stroke every 40 seconds. Stroke is a severe cardiovascular disease in which approximately 800,000 people in the United States every year are affected. Because of the debilitating neurological impact of stroke, many patients will require rehabilitation in order to reestablish motor functionality. Based on what uh, physical therapists said that we talked to, there are currently only qualitative measures for assessing progress of rehabilitation. The first method is an observational measurement, and that is an everyday activity and how well a patient does that activity, such as getting out of bed in the morning or brushing their teeth or eating food. The second measurement is a physiological measurement, and that occurs during a neurological exam in which a clinician will provide physical resistance to a patient's movements and then rank that on a scale of zero to five. Zero being no movement and five being perfect movement. Now, these methods are okay, but they are not ideal. For example, if a patient goes in to see their therapist and their therapist gives them a strength rating of a four, and then they go in to see their doctor and their doctor gives them a strength rating of three, because of uh, no quantitative measurements or unreliable ratings, patients oftentimes can get confused or unmotivated. And clinicians will oftentimes uh, tailor their therapy incorrectly based on false data. Furthermore, there is no reliable way for patients to prove the efficacy of their training regimens to their insurance companies in order to uh, receive compensation for all of their hard work. Because, ther because rehabilitation is not based on objective measures, it is incredibly difficult to track patient progress through rehabilitation. This, this draws us to our objective, which was to create a new quantitative way to measure uh, strength of movement and range of movement for rehabilitation patients, both instantaneously and over time. And now presenting the Exo My Glove. Jason. Thank you, Ryan. So looking at this need statement, uh, we began by looking at what sort of technologies we would need to incorporate into our final device to make sure that we're meeting all of our needs. Um, so the first one of these devices would be an accelerometer. And we use these accelerometers, or IMUs, to correlate um, their position to the exact orientation and position of the patient's fingers during therapy. The second technology would be an electromyogram. So an EMG is able to correlate um, a voltage difference into the amount of muscle recruitment that a patient is experiencing 
uh, when they try to move their hand in a certain way. On top of this, we are looking at um, incorporating conventional metrics into our device that physical therapists already use. Uh, some of these metrics would be heart rate, blood pressure, or blood oxygenation. And by incorporating those into the device, we can streamline uh, the goals for the physical therapist so that they can spend more time evaluating the data that our device gives them. Now with all of this, we need to have something like a microcontroller that interfaces all of our sensors with the computer so that we can output data that is um, useful not only for the physical therapist, but also for the patient. So going more in depth on specifically the accelerometer, our device uses the MPU6050 to assess the range of motion of the patient. As you can see on the screen, we have designed our own printed circuit board in order to minimize the, uh, the size of this device, because each of these has to go in a housing unit, and then each housing unit goes on a finger. Um, one, of the, one of the problems that plagued our early prototypes was large housing units, and so we had to reduce the size uh, to improve functionality. These accelerometers, in the end, return a percent of a baseline motion, uh, roughly about from 0 to, one, zero to 100 percent, correlating to 0 to 180 degrees of motion. Next, we focused on making our EMGs. So we wanted our EMGs to be reusable uh, between patients. Uh, traditional like adhesive electrodes would be inconvenient to exchange. And so we looked at creating a dry electrode that would have large surface area. Um, you can see on the screen a large surface area of copper that would promote proper adhesion to uh, our electrode and the patient's tissue. These electrodes were then incorporated into an armband that you can also see on the screen uh, that houses up to five electrodes and by adjusting the straps can uh, ensure that each electrode is making full contact with the skin. On top of this, incorporating them into the band design allows us to move the electrodes so that they can be positioned on top of a specific muscle of interest. Moving on with the heart rate monitor, um, one of the things we're looking at incorporating into this current device is the use of the high let go pulse sensor that uses photoplethysmography to essentially correlate light absorption to blood volume in the finger, which we can then correlate the blood volume to the pulsatile action of the heart. So when there's more blood volume in the finger, we know the heart is in diastole. And when there's less, it's in systole. So then taking this measurement over time, we can correlate this to the heart rate of the patient. So through this process, we went through many iterations of the device. Our first iteration can be seen here. It uses an inherently temporary breadboard and um, manufactured wrist brace that would make, uh, made for somebody who sprained their wrist. Uh, unfortunately, those housing units were large and the wires were hard to manage. So we moved on to a second iteration that helped to manage the wires better. We expanded the brace to improve the range of motion. And we also incorporated uh, some conductive fabrics to add onto our electrodes because even with the large surface area of copper on the bottom, they didn't always make full contact with the skin. And so finally, moving to our current iteration, the ExoMind glove, uh, we update, upgraded to a proto board that could have soldered connections from the microcontroller to the specific IMUs so that the connections would be permanent and the device would be more durable. We also included uh, new housing units that were even smaller than before. And now you can see the uh, Mayo band design that includes all of the EMGs, uh, we found that that was much more, much more effective for promoting full contact of the electrodes to the skin. So through this entire process, all of these iterations, there's one like common theme that all of our devices do. Um, this flowchart helps me describe that theme. So we begin by assessing the data from each individual sensor, the EMGs, the IMUs, as well as the heart rate monitor. The microcontroller then processes this data and converts it into an output that both physical therapists and patients can understand. And by doing so, we hope that they can answer three questions. One, are the exercises that the patient's performing being executed properly? Two, is there improvement of these exercises from the patient compared to their last visit? And three, is there a benefit to continue this therapy? So by doing this, we hope that we can uh, give the, the physicians the tools in order to correct the movement of the patient, adjust their therapy, and then decide whether or not further therapy is needed. And uh, Scott can continue. Thank you, Jason. <clears throat> so one of the very first things we did was perform a preliminary prior art search to make sure that what we were creating was in fact ours to create. Now, what's different about this, uh, our device is that it measures range of motion, strength of motion, and heart rate all in one device, which you can't find anywhere else in the market. Now, with these measurements, we're able to detect muscle activity, record finger 
positioning and suggests quantitative exercise corrections. So this, uh, in this, we can actually treat and evaluate in real time, which makes it extremely compatible with current rehabilitation exercises. Now, the robotics re rebuil rehabilitation market expects to hit $1.1 billion globally by 2021, not to mention a compound grand annual growth rate of 24%. Now, keeping in mind that most of our major competitors range from $350 and $15,000, this gave us a fun little challenge, and we were actually able to create this, our prototype here, for $120. Now we talked to a couple of manufacturers and actually raw materials and assembly alone will give us this product at $46 per unit. But when considering unexpected overhead, uh, quality testing, distribution, we estimated it to be around $55 per unit. Now everything we've presented up to this point has been completely open source. We have no patent pending and you can even find our code on GitHub and you can find our designs on hackaday.io. Now, why, you may ask? Because we believe that one solution isn't the only solution to a problem. We want to create a sense of community, innovation, and competition so that hopefully others will follow in our path and create an even better design. Now, uh, this leads into like, our actual real goal is to create a truly patient-centric device. Going off that, our, further, our future economic plan is to get ready for our next iteration. We have a team we're collaborating with in China called the Young Makers, and they have they t uh, challenged us to get our EMGs as accurate as possible and also to create a process so that we can find a baseline of range of motion and strength of motion for any individual. And to do this, we need to go further into the FDA process, so we, again, go through the 510K pathway more importantly, we need to address a institutional review board where with their approval, we can go on and do a lot of clinical studies. Now that's all we have for you, and I'd like to call up the rest of our team for the questions. Yes, uh, in the left. Um, how do you correlate the EMG data and the screen motion to the four measurements that the doctors were originally putting out? Right, so um, the, the measurements that the doctors collect aren't necessarily quantitative in terms of force. So right now, all of their measurements are quantitative. Uh, we're looking to be able to correlate the EMG measurements to a maximum contraction strength in the individual, whether that be for the individual muscle group that we're interested in, or a specific movement such as contraction, extension, or flexion in a certain direction. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, up front. Electrophysiological measurements usually contain a lot of artifacts, especially from EMG. How do you guys deal with those when doing your computational analysis? Okay. So in terms of noise in the data, essentially? Yeah, like movement artifacts. Um, so I suppose the EMGs that we're currently using, uh, the originally when we're using them individually, we're plagued with a lot of noise. We do include one EMG in the array of five on the band that acts as essentially, a, it, its output essentially is grounded to the rest of the output. So a noise in the general like movement and the range of motion in the arm is theoretically canceled out by the output from that EMG and then the others are used to collect data from specific muscles. Anyone else? Yes. Yes, so um, in, a, in our future iteration, our plan is to decrease um, all of the wiring on the device and include wireless functionality. Um, so all of the finger pieces uh, are separate from the, the main um, piece. So there's no wiring in the glove so that you have more range of movement, movement for the patient. Thank you.
Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for coming out. Before we begin, we'd like to first thank BMES for this opportunity. We are all extremely excited to be here. We are Synapto, a venture aiming to revolutionize the early diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease. Hi, my name is, Hi, my name is Dhruv Patel, and I'm a co-founder and CEO. Hi, my name is Christopher Loka, and I'm a co-founder and CTO. And I'm Mega Gugari, the lead software engineer. Two of our members are sitting right here. We have David Bogner, who's the lead systems engineer, and Anup Patel, who's the lead R&D engineer. <clears throat> so current Alzheimer's diagnosis consists of methods such as MRI, PET, and CT scans, which can be extremely expensive, costing individuals up to $5,000, and can take up more than a year for diagnosis to take place. Another issue that's existing is that Alzheimer's can actually manifest in a person's brain up to 10 years prior to any symptoms being shown. So by the time a patient actually goes in for a diagnosis, it's usually in the very much later stages of the disease. So with our product, we are aiming to solve all of these problems. So Alzheimer's is the sixth leading cause of death in the world, and currently one in 10 uh, seniors above the age of 65 have it. It's also the most expensive disease in America, resulting in uh, Americans spending about $2.7 billion each year on just diagnosis alone. And this number is expected to increase with the aging population of baby boomers and the increased life expectancy. More specifically, there is expected to be a 51.5 population increase of 65 and over over the next 13 years. And by 2050, there's expected to be around 16 million people with Alzheimer's, about triple the number of uh, people currently that have, have Alzheimer's currently. All right. So how do we actually tackle the task of diagnosing Alzheimer's? Well, uh, so research has shown that there are quantitative differences between the brain waves of those who have Alzheimer's and those who don't. And so we take that data and we take features like that, such as uh, P50, N, uh, N100, and P200, and those describe peaks and troughs in the, in the brainwave data. We, in, we input these features into a, into a machine learning program where we train and cross-validate the data to obtain an accuracy. We then are combining that with new open source EEG hardware that has allowed it to become more affordable and portable, and we plan on integrating this into a combined package where we can affordably and excessively diagnose Alzheimer's. And so here we have a quick video of how of how we view our um, of how we view our testing protocol to work, or how we view it to look like. So here you'll see me putting on the headset. It's actually an open source, open BCI headset, and uh, you'll see Chris putting on two um, two electrodes, one on uh, both sides of my ear. One is for a reference or a ground, and the other is for noise artifact removal. And I'm about to undergo what's called the oddball paradigm test. It's basically a series of randomized sequence of tones, a high frequency and a low frequency tone. And every time I hear a high frequency tone, you'll see me in a few seconds press a space button. And in response to each high frequency tone, my brain's, uh, my brain's response will be recorded from the EEG, and there'll be a standardized curve of the peaks and troughs of what the brain wave looks like. Now we take brain waves like these from healthy control patients and standardize them into one or standardize them into conserved values of maximum and minimum values. And then we take that same model and apply it to Alzheimer's patients and compare it using a machine learning algorithm. So as I mentioned before, um, current Alzheimer's diagnosis consists of questionnaires, family history, or MRI CT scans. So all of these methods have certain limitations. With MRI or CT scans, although it's objective and non-invasive, it is not very affordable, accessible, or rapid. Family history and questionnaires lack objectiveness and um, accessibility for family history. So our device excels in all of these components, being objective, rapid, non-invasive, affordable, and accessible. And so currently with data collaboration agreements with institutions around the world, including the CERT Institute in Greece, University of Sao Paulo in Brazil, we were able to gain actual clinical data from patients and analyze it using our, our own feature extraction and machine learning algorithms, which were able to accurately predict whether a patient has Alzheimer's or not up to 80% of the time. Now this value is actually comparable to and even higher than some of, these, some of those reported in literature. 
Moreover, we've been featured in over 26 news outlets, some of which include Forbes, Science Magazine, Washingtonian, and many more, um, which you can visit on our website, sinalco.io. And we've also been named national NIH debut finalists, or uh, winners, and launched a UMD crowdfunding campaign that got us around $3,430. Uh, $3, right, so where do we envision, envision this uh, product being put in the market? So on the patient care side, uh, there are over 1,500 geriatric clinics in the U.S. And where we see this being put is when a, pa when a patient reaches the age of, say, 55 or 60, uh, maybe once every three years, they would come in and take these tests for maybe $200, $300 uh, maximum. And then this would uh, be a first line of testing for Alzheimer's. So if they see that they um, may, be, may be positive for Alzheimer's, they would go in for further testing using MRI machines. The other possibility is on the research side. So currently there are over 500 current trials, for, including Alzheimer's, for you know, drugs and treatments. And just about all of these need a way to measure the severity of Alzheimer's. Currently this is done with MRI machines, which can cost over $3,000, $4,000. And our device is supposed to cost in the hundreds. So, meeting, uh, so, with, so with our device substituting these devices, um, measuring the severity of Alzheimer's, this would allow companies to save millions of dollars per, per trial when they try to measure the efficacy and effectiveness of their drug. And so most recently, we've actually formed a limited liable corporation, which serves as, a, as an integral role in the next step of our project, as it enables us to become eligible for SBIR, or Small Business Innovation and Research Federal Grants. We hope to take this money and pursue a clinical pilot study in which we can gain proprietary data, run our own an data analytics, and generate a software and hardware integration system, which we can then improve the entire accuracy and efficacy of the system as a whole. We hope to take this system and push it through a class two 510K regulatory pathway in which we can prove that entire entirety of the accuracy and um, sensitivity of the device. After doing this, we hope to change the National Neurologic Diagnostic Manuals to, uh, to include this device as it is needed to all patients so that it can be provided through and reimbursed through public and private insurance companies alike. So as you guys ask questions, we leave you from, with a poem by Owen Darnell about the tragedy of Alzheimer's. Thank you. Compared to a what electrode uh, system? Top uh, electro EEG with the wet electrode versus the moving human. Mm -hmm. How does it compare? Yeah. All right. So actually, um, so the institution in Greece that he mentioned before actually used a one of those systems. It's a very high density one. It has two fifty six electrodes. The one that we have currently uses is about sixteen. And so uh, what we did is that we fa we also used another uh, institutions where they had only nine electrodes on their um, on their system. One of them, the, the one from, from Greece was wet, the one from the nine electric system was dry. And we both, uh, we did uh, machine learning testing in both of them and found them to both be 70% accurate. So it looks like, appears from this kind of data that uh, the quality of the system, because of the, the lack of, the increased correlation between the 256 electrodes and, the, and how machine learning works, that the accuracy is about the same. For sure. So the first part of it is actually um, the, the point of the device is to make it more accessible and affordable so you don't have to pay thousands of dollars. But the, but the second part of that question is, so the, the data that we got from the Brazil, Brazil is, uses MMSE score, which is, means that they are already post-symptomatic for Alzheimer's. So yes, uh, right now we'd be diagnosing uh, a, a more late-stage Alzheimer's. But our plan right now is to 
uh, we've been looking at a lot of clinical trials, so we want to tag along with those clinical trials that are already using uh, controlled patients that have Alzheimer's and get our device on them so we can just measure the severity of all their Alzheimer's and correlate it with the, one, uh, the measurements they're getting from their e MRI machines. And actually some of the data that we received from uh, the University of Sao Paulo included each patient's MMSC score, and that's basically just a score from 0 to 30 identifying their severity, as well as a clinical dementia rating, CDR score, which is another rating scale, I think it's from zero to three. And so what we can do is we use the combinations of these two scores indicating severity and attach them to each patient's biomarkers, thus developing a spanning machine learning algorithm. So that's how you can test severity. Yeah. Of course, of course. So one of the problems with, uh, with Alzheimer's right now is that there's no current treatment, right? But um, th one of the big benefits is a family planning, but the bigger one, I believe, is the ability to get into early clinical trials for novel drugs. So you know there are over 500 current clinical trials for Alzheimer's right now. Maybe one of them could be the right one, and you have a much higher chance of getting into them if you are uh, only early onset. Exactly, and that's one of the things I really love about this technology because there's nothing out there that's diagnosing the Alzheimer's patients early on, and by generating these new early diagnoses, we can have more of these clinical trials accept new patients and thus change the entire landscape of the entire, you know, of the Alzheimer's drug, um, drug development process. And another, another thing is that if you start a drug regimen earlier, there is a higher chance of not the plaques being reversed, but the plaques being slowed down as well as new technologies that are being developed, such as neurofeedback. Yeah, sure. I, I'd love to mention this because we're actually working with the predicate device manufacturers. Um, they're, they're called Neba, and so they're using an electroencephalogram to uh, develop biomarkers in ADHD. And, are they, are they, and they, are, they are cleared, yes. No, they, they have a diagnostic add-on to that, yep. Yeah, so with the clinical data that we've received, um, we don't exactly know how earlier on it can be, but we, what we do know is that the amyloid plaques do develop in an Alzheimer's patients up to 10 years before clinical symptoms are actually presented. Right, we're not sure yet because we haven't actually yeah. tested this on real patients. Um, we actually wanted to test this on ourselves, but even the IRB wouldn't let us do that. So, <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully, yeah. but still which is one of the reasons why we're pushing for a clinical pilot study in the next few months. Morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Cameron Keen. This is Ramatul and Prabhuti, and together we are Team Caracol. Um, about one and a half years ago, we started researching into the bioprinting market, and what we found is there's a surprising lack of like industrial industrialization of 3D printing. 3D printing at the moment is carried out in labs where you print one sample at a time. Um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to push 3D printing into a situation where, we, where you'd have printing farms, such that you could print several samples at the same time. And these would be used in situations where you're researching on specific drugs. So for example, one thing that we could use is for um, research into drug development. Um, or another one is patient-specific drug treatments. Um, so our solution is a self-contained bioprinter. Um, that controls various environmental parameters. Um, so basically what, what we want to do is we want to take our printer, we want to put it in a situation where you can have several of these lined up along the bench rather than having one printer in a self-contained bio hood. Okay, so speaking about the product features, um, our design incorporates three different independent extruder heads which would, be able, which would be used in order to print various substances. The goal of this project was basically 
to not, to not just have a system which would have temperature and humidity control within the printing chamber itself, but also be able to control the carbon dioxide concentration in it as well. This would essentially give the user the ability to print within a biological incubator. The sterility of the printing chamber is maintained using UV LED sources along with a HEPA filter. Basically, the laminar flow system within the printer itself, using the HEPA filter, makes sure the sterility within the chamber is maintained. So I'll talk some more about the laminar flow. So in, um, there are three 12-volt blower fans with, which help ensure maintain the sterility within the system. So during operation, there is only one blower fan which maintains circulation through the HEPA filter around the printing chamber while distributing heat. However, when the door is opened, all three fans work in conjunction to push air through the HEPA filter and outs outside the system, ensuring positive pressure and maintaining the sterility of the system. This is one of the most incredibly important features of our system because this essentially el eliminates the use of a laminar flow cabinet during operation. The versatility of our system lies in the three different extruder heads. As we, we have temperature control on all three extruder heads, this can be used in the same print cycle to print different substances which, which might which might be required to print in sequences. So in terms of um, testing our system, we basically, we basically printed algae and gelatin hydrogels embedded with UVEX cells under varying parameters such as the needle size, the extrusion rate, and the layer heights. So to test the, to ensure that our printer actually works, what we did was we conducted live dead assays. Um, so we conducted live dead assay on the printed construct from Caracol, which is our printer, which is a self-enclosed unit. And we also conducted, compared it with a traditional printer that needs to be kept inside a laminar flow hood. So the assay results told us that the results were very similar. So what we concluded was all the necessary conditions that the cell needs for survival was there. And as you can see, there are live cells from Caracol, which is figure A. All right, so our printer is suitable for small research facilities, universities, and schools, as it's very affordable compared to what we have in the market right now. Um, because Caracol is a standalone unit, its ability to perform really well in a biological print farm um, environment enables us to print large quantities of tissue sample at a short period of time, um, which makes it ideal for industries like pharmaceutical industries and then cosmetic industries where a lot of testing takes place. So a prime example of this would be the oncological research field right now. Um, currently, research in oncology depends mostly on 2D cult cell culture models, um, but they lack and they fail to get the, the, what's it called? The native environment of the tissue. So with 3D printed samples, what we can do is we can mimic the native environment of the tissue and simulate in vitro conditions, which could possibly aid in development of therapeutic um, drugs, including anti-cancer drugs. So in terms of the market of 3D bioprinting so far, um, the Americas contain a huge portion of the global 3D bioprinting environment. So basically, it's over 50% that is controlled by the Americas. In the United States alone, the oligopoly of the companies that do 3D bioprinting have about 42% market share of the entire global 3D bioprinting industry for which this is exactly one of the first major problems that we would encounter when we try and go into production. This product, when we try and, when we try and put it back, put it into the market, as there are such big companies, it would definitely be a problem for us to actually go into production and compete in terms of research and development. So in terms of production of the actual system itself, 
Our initial raw material cost is set at about $2,100, while the selling price would be projected at about $10,000. At this selling price, we would actually look at, like, if we look at a five-year five -year plan, at the end of the fifth, and fifth year of operations, we would be looking at about $100,000 per annum profits. Even though this price might seem a bit high, in terms of the competition in the market, we still have a very good competitive edge, as you can see, because all the other bioprinters are very high in prices. We, are not, we haven't filed for a patent yet, but we plan to do that and go through the 510K pre-market notifications and conduct post-approval studies after we've been cleared. In conclusion, what we've developed is a completely self-contained bioprinter that can sit on the bench top in any laboratory and you can have several of these placed in a row. This makes it an extremely unique um, printer in the market as most of the printers in the market today, in fact all of the printers in the market today, need to be placed under a laminar flow hood to print live cells. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Danny and Pamela, who are our other teammates who didn't make it here today, Dr. Kanal Mitra, um, who was our faculty advisor, and Dr. Conway, who was our department head, and everyone else who helped us with our project. Is there any other questions? So what we, we were not actually talking about the device. We were thinking about what's been produced from the device would probably need clearance. That's what we were thinking about, not, not the printer itself. So the novel system of the printer compared to competitors, if you look at other competitors um, like Cellink and all them, they've all got an open printer that isn't, doesn't have a laminar flow system inbuilt within it. So when you're printing with one of those um, printers, when you print with cells, you have to place it inside a laminar flow cabinet. Um, now obviously those are big and um, we don't have a lot of those um, in labs. For example, when we were experimenting, when we started out, we had trouble getting access to a laminar flow hood. Um, so this allows us to print outside of a laminar flow hood, so you're not restricted by the size of the laminar flow cabinet or by the quantity of them. So you can have several of these placed along the bench, which nobody else is doing at the moment. So, we're just showing that that is one example of where this could be useful, because obviously when you're screening, when you're doing research into cancer, you don't need one or two samples like a conventional printer could print, you'd need several samples um, to have rep a repet repetition in the results in that. So this would allow you to pr prepare one sample of cells, print it several times and perform that test over the seven different samples. So have you guys done some verification of that? Like, like biophysics, Yeah, we... Oh. We've actually been working with a composition of alginate gelatin um, embedded with Hubex cells, and we're, we'll probably look into that. We're mostly going into the drug testing, drug line, that route. So we also managed to prove to that um, compared to a printer, a typical printer, printer um, that's printing inside a laminar flow cabinet, um, that's a sample B there, we were able to keep cells alive outside of the laminar flow hood using our printer. No, that is 3D, yes. Yeah. What's kind of like the standard operating procedure of, of using a device that's outside of a laminar flow hood, but you still have to kind of get in there to do what you need to do? Um, so essentially, it acts as a small laminar flow hood itself. So most of the things that you do inside a laminar hood, you do inside of this <coughs> machine. So when you're preparing your samples, you could use the bottom tray to um, like insert the cells into the syringe and load them up because that whole environment is laminar flow you'll still maintain sterility so typically you'd m prepare your samples inside a big laminar flow hood where you'd have one one big uh, sample set and then take them over to the printer and be able to load them into each individual printer 
as a micro laminar flow hood in themselves. And laminar flow hoods are quite expensive, so let's say if a startup wanted to do some testings, they could just buy one of these printers and do a bunch of tests, and then they, if they wanted to invest in a laminar flow hood, they could do that as well. Um, as far as I'm aware, it's a BSL-2, the grade. So because as it's uh, combining airflow from both two sides and expelling it out of the system, not like combining the inner air and, and the filtered air together and expelling it. So that for that, the grade would be BSL-2. Any other questions? Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Hello everybody, my name is Matthew Schneck. I'm up here with Kelsey Hidashima. We are representing Virginia Commonwealth University from Richmond, and we are presenting our product called Tremor Track. 17 years ago, my grandfather was diagnosed with an essential tremor. Undergoing the best treatment available at the time, his disease didn't get better. It got progressively worse. A few years down the road, he was forced to shut the door to his dentistry practice because he could no longer hold the drill steady in somebody's mouth. Come to find out, he was wrongfully diagnosed with an essential tremor. He had Parkinson's disease, something that if treated properly at an early stage, the progression could have been mediated. Unfortunately, Matt's story is not a rare occurrence. 40 million people are affected by movement disorders in the United States, mainly that of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor, two progressive neurological disorders. They both begin as a slight tremor, however, they progress into completely different diseases. Parkinson's disease progresses into resting tremor, bradykinesia, and rigidity, leading to balance issues. However, essential tremor progresses into action tremor, head tremor, and voice tremor. Due to the similar clinical manifestations at the early stage of disease, there's a high misdiagnosis rate. General practitioners misdiagnose 80% of the time, general neurologists 50% of the time, and movement disorder specialists 20% of the time. Because of the high misdiagnosis rate, 65% of movement disorder patients get their diagnosis changed at least once during their course of treatment. This causes an increased healthcare cost and $300 million are spent annually on treatment due to misdiagnosis. There's a need for a device to distinguish between early stages of Parkinson's disease and essential tremor. This is based off of the lack of quantitative information on tremor. We need to efficiently present data to healthcare professionals not pose any significant safety risks, and have materials cost under $200 per unit to ease adoption into clinical settings. That's where we come in, Tremor Track. We're an early and accurate differentiation system between essential tremor and Parkinson's disease. We are able to distinguish between the char subtle characteristic differences between the two diseases. Our goals are to improve care, save money, and high throughput screening. The next major question to be addressed is how does our device work? With the primary goal of providing quantitative information to a diagnostic process that typically relies on qualitative information, we've integrated a hand tracking system and a head tracking system to do just that. Our hand tracking system utilizes the Leap Motion, a video gaming controller that is able to track hands. With the software that we developed, we're able to track a hand on over 20 points and then export this data into our algorithm, which analyzes and presents this data to physicians. Alongside this hand tracking system, we've also created a head tracking system that utilizes a combination of Arduino, accelerometers, and wireless transmission chips, again, to send the data through our algorithm and present this to physicians. Here is an example of our first prototype. On the left, you'll see a picture of the headpiece. As I mentioned, you'll notice the Arduino, accelerometers, and wireless transmission chips. On the right, you'll see our hand tracking system. We use the Leap Motion camera due to its infrared abilities. The thing that's unique about our product that no competition has ever done before is that we are able to track 20 points on the hand in a completely non-invasive manner. When analyzing tremor, the second you put something on the hand, you interfere with how that tremor is manif manifested. Here is a video to demonstrate how the leap motion tracking works. As you can see, every one of those colored dots is being tracked in real time. We're able to track these dots in the x dimension, the y dimension, and the Z dimension. 
Our software then exports this data into our algorithm, which analyzes and displays this for physicians to use. I'm not sure if we have audio up here, but we'll see. No, we do not. So I'm going to narrate this for you. We're going to do a brief demonstration of our product. So the first step for this is to collect a series of demographic information from our subject. We get sex, ethnicity, age, and then we assign every patient a subject ID to assured uh, anonymous data. After agreeing to participate in the study, the patient will be asked to uh, specify a time duration for how long to conduct the test. In this example, we'll use 10 seconds. After agreeing to this, the patient will place his hand over the tracking camera, which will then analyze the X, Y, and Z position of all 20 of the points on the hand. Following collection of this data, the patient will begin the next portion of the test, which is the spiral test. This test is used to assess the ability of the patient to perform f fine motor movements. The patient will be asked to trace a spiral from the inside out as fast as possible. Uh, based on the deviation from this spiral, we're able to get a good metric of uh, the tremor. For the last step of this test, the patient will place the head tracking system atop his or her head. Following placement of this device, the patient will click Start Test, which will begin to track and analyze the head movement. And the way this head tracking system works is it's analyzing a series of accelerometers and then wirelessly transmitting data over a serial port into a computer. Following collection of this data, we display the results section to the physician. And so this section is able to demonstrate all of the metrics that we have collected. Here's a second look at that results section. The important thing to recognize here is that this test only takes 30 seconds to one minute to perform. Because of that, it's easily integrated into the normal physical exam performed by primary care physicians all around the world. With this screen, physicians were able to look at head and neck tremor in the X, Y, and Z dimensions, as well as at a resting state to analyze for resting tremor, or an extended state to analyze for action tremor, key diagnostic markers when it comes to picking between the two diseases. In order to provide quality control for this device, we ran a series of tests on a servo motor which oscillates a hand of specific frequency. We ran tests at every integer frequency from one to 10 hertz. Here's a sample of data at three hertz. And as you can see, on the top part of that graph, we were able to track the amplitude of the tremor. And on the bottom half of that graph, we're able to analyze the frequency content, which is pretty much exactly what we simulated, three hertz. To ensure that this was uh, accurate, we compared it alongside something known as the TrackStar tracking system, which utilizes magnets in order to calculate distance moved um, on a place of the hand. Um, and again, like I mentioned earlier, ours is unique in that we don't require anything to be placed on the hand, and our system is available for a tenth of the cost of this system. Uh, in order to ensure that we're able to track frequency over time, we calculated the spectrogram of this signal. Um, the darker the red indicates the more powerful the frequency content at that specific point. And as you can see, at around three hertz, or our simulated tremor, um, the frequency content is consistent over time, suggesting that our device does not lose its ability um, as the test progresses. Again, similar data presented here. This is for our head tracking system. Um, can be analyzed in the X, Y, and Z dimension as well. In terms of traction that we've received, uh, we have established an IRB for movement disorder studies with our clinical collaborators at the Veterans Hospital as well as at the VCU Health System in Virginia. Uh, and we've also been given access to a patent attorney through our school's Innovation Gateway, who will help us potentially secure a patent as well as licensing our device. Um, the initial application has been filed, and we're hoping that goes well. In terms of the marketability of this device, we'll first look at the total addressable market. Uh, this is the amount of money spent on movement disorders annually in the United States. This figure is approximately $30 billion, or 3% of all US federal healthcare spending. A subset of this, the serviceable addressable market, is approximately 1.7 billion. This is the amount spent on diagnosis. Now, most importantly, the serviceable attainable market, or our room to make money, is approximately $187.5 million. This figure was estimated by multiplying the device cost and the profit per device times the number of estimated users, or the number of primary care physicians in the United States. Moving forward with this, we are currently in the proof of concept stage. We're collaborating with our clinical partners to ensure that our device is capable of distinguish distinguishing between these diseases. 
Uh, after that, we would like to encourage clinical adoption. So we want to get this into the primary care clinics to serve as a tool for primary care physicians to determine whether or not they need to refer somebody to more specialized care. It's important to note that we do not intend to replace the expertise of neurologists or movement disorder specialists. We simply serve to create a tool that can be used by primary care physicians to provide better quality of life and earlier detection of these diseases. Lastly, we'd like to translate this device to the research environment where we can use it to further quantify and characterize the entire spectrum of movement disorders and ultimately help provide a better quality of life for those 40 million people in the US with movement disorders. Tremor track. It's as innovative as it gets. We're able to track 20 different points on the hand non invasively, and we supplement this with a head tremor tracking system. It's affordable, it's obtainable, and it's easily implementable into multiple primary care facilities across the United States. With that, we'd like to thank the VCU Department of Biomedical Engineering for supporting us, particularly Dr. Wetzel for his advisory role, as well as Dr. Rebecca Heiss for use of resources. Uh, we'd also like to recognize the Sternheimer Foundation for their monetary support of this project as well as BMES for hosting us. Uh, thank you all very much, and we'd like to open the floor for questions. So working with one of the movement disorder specialists at the Veterans Hospital and poring over multiple research papers, we found that the major differences between the tremor is between frequency and amplitude. So for Parkinson's disease, it has a low frequency, high amplitude, versus a central tremor has a low amplitude and a high frequency. That's another reason why we decided to incorporate the head tremor tracking unit, because head tremor is normally only seen in a central tremor versus Parkinson's disease, which helps facilitate the doctor in making a more informed diagnosis. Um, so we're looking at amplitude, frequency, frequency dispersion is another one that we look at. Um, we also, the, at the very beginning page, we ask for age and things like that, gender, um, which is another difference between the two diseases as well. <laughs> So we're currently in the stages of characterizing and quantifying these diseases, and that's a really good question, but the major problem with this is Parkinson's disease and essential tremor are traditionally qualitatively diagnosed diseases. So if you go on PubMed and search for this, you're not gonna find a ton of literature that's peer reviewed and supported to suggest what these boundaries are. And so while we are able to come up with and determine these quantitative features, we're also in the game of further characterizing and quantifying the entire spectrum of diseases to make this easier for us. And so, like Kelsey mentioned earlier, our collaboration with clinical specialists is helping us define these boundaries. And working with one of the um, very experienced movement disorder specialists, he has a pool of pre-diagnosed patients, um, and he's very confident in their diagnoses. And so the more data we get from these patients, the more accurately we're able to, to differentiate between them. Yes? So in terms of normalization, uh, we're, one of the big things we're doing is collecting demographic information, first of all. Um, but again, like I mentioned earlier, the problem is there's not a ton of data to normalize this to. Uh, so we're very innovative in the fact that we're one of the first people to look at these quantitative differences. And so eventually our goal is to be able to provide a normalization factor uh, for both for research and clinical purposes. However, that's going to be derived from our further clinical collaborations. Yes. Okay, so that has to do with that they're both progressive neurological disorders. Um, and when they start in the initial stages of disease, like I said, it's the very slight tremor. Um, and this can be, if say it's diagnosed as a central tremor, this is normally treated, it seems that alcohol can be beneficial, also beta blockers, um, topiramate, and things like that. 
However, if they actually have Parkinson's disease, that's actually treated with dopaminergic drugs like gabapentin and things like that. And so if they're started, these are completely two different treatment methods. And if they're started, say, on the like alcohol or the beta blockers instead of the dopaminergic drugs that they need to be started on, it can cause the disease to progress a lot faster because you're not treating the actual disease, the actual symptoms that the patient is having because they're mis or mischaracterized as central tremor versus Parkinson's. Any other questions? Yes. yes. Uh, so the initial plan is to get this into primary care clinics. Um, and so our serviceable obtainable market is calculated based on the number of primary care physicians uh, in the United States. And so this would put us, put us in the clinical adoption phase. Uh, and this is where we're at right now. A long-term growth, we would like to move into the research environment. Uh, the, the data would be incredibly valuable to get this widespread and to get data on movement disorder patients from all over. Uh, but to answer your question specifically, uh, we're selling this to primary care physicians to start. Absolutely. Yeah, so um, like I mentioned, the, one of the biggest things with this is we're tracking 20 points on the hand, including individual fingers, and we're also doing this in a non-invasive manner. And so when you're tracking tremors, the most important thing is that you are not interfering with the manifestation of it. If you put something on the hand, the tremor could be altered, your data is not worth anything. Um, and so by doing that, it's something that's never been done in the field before. Uh, this has been verified initially by our patent attorney as well as by our clinical expert. Uh, so we're, uh, we're basing our novelty on the ability to track non-invasively and the multiple points on the hand. And if there aren't any other questions, uh, thank you everybody. Oh yeah, one more question. Sure. Um, in terms of the regulatory pathway, um, it's not going to be an invasive device, so we definitely won't need to uh, undergo significant clinical trials. What's that? Oh. Um, but we'll probably go with the um, just traditional device exemption um, in that there's no um, potential harm from the device, no electric shock, it's not invasive, um, so just regular non-exempt device route. Yeah, and it must be most likely be classified as a class one like FDA device. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Uh, have a great rest of the day.